I said, hey, all right, I'm done. Oh, and then I just sorted out. Hello and welcome to the Bulwark's Next Level Sunday interview. I'm your host, Tim Miller. I am here today with Coach Prime, Sarah Longwell, who obviously had to join us because we had a special guest, a really special guest today, Henry Winkler. Uh, she's a big fan of Coach Klein from The Waterboy, which is something I think you might have heard of. And uh, is, that's your most famous role, right? You know, Henry, you know, we've lost Henry. It isn't, it isn't my most famous. My most famous role <laughs> is Grandfather. Oh, okay. You know, one right after that is Barry. Is uh, uh, We're going to talk about Barry. What do you got there? Coach Klein. He's got it right there in the office. Okay. I love that. And here it is, Sarah. Bobby Boucher. This is on its way to you. You're going to send me your address. <laughs> me. And I'm going to sign it. Oh, man. It, water sucks. <laughs> and it will be coming to you. This will, that will have a place of honor in the Bulwark office. Yeah, so wait, let me just say why why I'm here, which is that I'm a massive fan of yours, and uh, but I also co-host a podcast with Tim, uh, publisher of The Bulwark. But what happens is when Tim does these uh, interviews and it's somebody that one of us is obsessed with, we get to be the co-host on the show. Uh, but normally I look normal, but today I went to the eye doctor for the very first time and they dilated my pupils, which is not a thing I knew that they did. And now I have to look like either, so I decided in an homage to, to, to you, to the Fonz, I was going to wear these aviators. Uh, and I know I don't look that cool, but I'm doing it. No. Uh, and I'm just happy to be here. All right. Uh, yeah, if you, this is an homage to the Fonz. So let me just tell you, you look hey. very cool. Thank you look you. very cool. Thank you. Mm. Oh, so great. The fun, right. I got to tell you, I disagree on that one, the Fonz, but we could uh, we can discuss that in post as well. Okay. So uh, people might be wondering, why is Henry Winkler here? I'm kind of wondering that, actually, and I'm the host. And so and I want to start. Him. Okay, I want to start with, yeah, Liz. You, Whereas you, I, I watch you as a commentator. I have watched you for quite a while now. And I find you to be uh, incredibly perceptive, uh, straightforward. And I saw it, you know, um, uh, you asked and I had to say yes. Thank you. I was a little concerned about that because usually when I ask somebody of your status and they're as nice to me as you were, it's either one, they're about to blow me off or two, you have... A little bit of a cable TV habit that we might have to that we might have to check in on. So I'm just a little concerned. You're not you're you're yeah, doing an appropriate amount of part, cable TV. The second part, Tim, is true. I am an avid watcher of television. Okay. My <laughs> wife and I uh, have great recommendations of uh, wonderful shows. Uh, if you're interested. Okay, we'll get to those at the end. So th give me just your, your politics a little bit for our politics listeners. We could start there. I, I was listening to another one of your interviews. You said this. You said, I detest a person who said you're an actor. You shouldn't be political. You shouldn't have a thought. I liked that quote. You know, it's kind of the, an the inverse to shut up and dribble. And so I'm just wondering, you, you have some thoughts, you have some politics. What are, what are the things that got you most, get you most okay, passionate so, in that space? All right. So the, the granddaddy of my thought is this. This country, or maybe even the West, I do the Western culture, I don't know, but this country is where I live. I love, I love my country. We are obsessed with the wrong P. We are obsessed with profit over population. I don't know what has happened we elect these human beings and they govern only themselves. There might be three people there who actually care about 300 million, but I have yet to uh, see them. And I mean, I, uh, you know, wonder then, like there is this kind of intra fight, I guess, within the kind of pro-democracy coalition, if you will. We might broadly all be on the same side about that, that that maybe the Democrats could do better by trying to address that. I mean, Joe Biden is today, the day we're taping this, he's actually with the UAW, the folks striking with the UAW. 
uh, and and that and there's some that argue that maybe he could benefit from focusing more on that, on on the economic issues rather than the than the identity issues. You know what? And, I I I don't, I don't have an answer to that. I don't know what the answer is. I know this. Where I think, I feel we are on a precipice. We are on a precipice that is literally cemented by passionate hate. Mm. And the, so that means that if there is a flood one way or the other, that precipice is going to collapse because it is built on mud. And I think we have to focus. I, I, this has always been my, my uh, vision. You're yeah. on your roof. You've been in the middle of a tragedy. Your belongings, everything you own is completely destroyed under your roof. A boat is coming. You have no water. Are you going to say, what is the color of your skin? No, turn around, go back. What is your political affiliation? No, 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 please don't save me. Get out of here. I think we are on the brink of insanity. We might even be over the brink a little bit. Well, that might be. <laughs> I am a popular thinker. I have grandchildren, and I, it scares the hell out of me. You know, I read somewhere, Did you, your parents fled Nazi Germany. Is that they correct? Did. Yes. And how much of that... Uh, Sometimes Tim and I joke, uh, we have a, a one of our friends, Bill Crystal, uh, who we joined with in this sort of pro-democracy time we all came together. We used to joke that there was kind of a coalition of Jews and gays uh, that, that came together in the Trump years, the, a lot of us Republicans. Um, do you think there's something about that being in your past that has made you extra concerned about this time or something that resonates or echoes about that time? Well, one thing is for sure is that uh, anti-Semitism is on the rise. But I will say that my parents escaping a country, leaving the country, they, I mean, this, uh, this is a very interesting thing. Leaving a country that you love, that you're born in, that you're raised in, you know, you know the language, and have to go to a whole new country and learn a whole new language because you're going to be killed has given me a tenacity, I think, that is deep in my DNA. And I look at the border, and yes, we could probably uh, really work on that, uh, but those people are not just leaving Venezuela or Honduras or wherever they're coming from. Because, hey, it's the thing to do. Let's just give up everything and go, you know, march miles through a jungle, get raped, get, get robbed, get disease, get bitten by a snake. Yeah, there's no doubt. There is something to that. That fear that drives a lot of people that are coming here, you know, I think... Is certainly true, and I think that it gets missed a lot. Like when you but talk to world. people in these communities, yeah, the entire that, world is. seems to be moving. Everybody is 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 shifting because of um, coups and gangs and rape and killing and devaluation of their money and. There's no doubt. It's crazy to me. It is crazy. And I've said this. It's the thing that's been kind of frustrating to me about this administration is that I just think this fear of the demonization of those groups, that that's going to be effective politically, has kind of stopped us, you know, from from trying to like seriously address this together. And it was kind of a bar bipartisan thing. It wasn't that long ago. This was a bi bipartisan thing trying to at least deal with the border in a compassionate way. But anyway, I, I didn't I didn't actually have you here to like get into the like the details of border policy. Um, I do want to talk about that's great because you know, I'm lessons that could be le lessons that could be learned from 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 your life and your career. But I, I wanted to talk about some things before we get to TV about your life. You know, um, you. 
uh, uh, have cited. Uh, one of the reasons for your acti- activism is learning differences you had growing up. Uh, you've written a bunch of kids' books. You have a new kids' book out, Detective Duck. Um, that, that, and you have another series of kids' books that help kids that, that learn differently. I'm just but I, I wonder, all common, I for you to... Tim. It's okay, really important is that we just say we write, Lynn, um, Oliver, and I write funny first because yeah. we want to be the gateway to reluctant readers. You know, I got uh, one of those. In, in some of our books, we have written chapters that are one paragraph. So if you have homework and you must read a chapter a night, you read your paragraph, you're done. <laughs> 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 this is good though. this seems like you're helping kids get out of work but that's not really it talk because so i want you for listeners who don't know your background talk about that like your childhood and how you kind of struggled with 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 reading and 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 other things and other you know school well, work and how that kind of led to this well you know i i've said this before i'm in the bottom three percent academically <laughs> in america uh i got like uh 120 over uh, my name on my math score on the SATs. I, uh, you know, I was, I, I applied to 28 colleges. I got into one. Which one was uh, that? Well, I got into two, but I never heard of the other one. <laughs> Where um, did you go? I went to Emerson in Boston. Sure. And I had the greatest time and I am grateful to them. I don't mean to age you. Norman Lear also went there. Were you there together? No, 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 Norman Lear might be like a hundred. I have no idea. Anybody two years older than me are over is the same age. So I have no, I have no concept. I'm with you. I'm with you. You and I were in seventh grade together. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, the struggle inside, you think I'm not stupid. I don't want to be stupid. But everybody from the earliest time is saying you are, and like a little duckling, you imprint. And until like two weeks ago, I thought I was stupid. You know, you just you just believe it, and then you believe, well, I can't do anything. And what I the, one of the lessons that I have learned in my in my life is that the time is right this second. You go, oh my god, I'm too old. Oh my god, I've got children. Oh my god, I'm busy. I've got a podcast. There is no, I can't do that. I want to do that. I can't do that. I can't. But you can. You don't know what you can accomplish until you put one foot in front of the other. As simple as that. So how did you, how did you, what was your like moment of overcoming this? How did you come to that? You don't overcome it. Sarah, you don't overcome it. What you do is you negotiate. You're in constant negotiation with your challenge. And you push yourself. I was a negative thinker. I used to walk myself in a circle in the rug. So I can't do this. I, I can't play this. I, I don't know how I'll never be able to. And then I finally got so bored with myself. <laughs> I said, just shut the hell up and fly. Either you're going to crash or you're going to be okay. But just shut the fuck up and uh i i got myself to that point so many times going to broadway doing a neil simon play playing scrooge um i i am writing the books i i said i can't do that i'm dyslexic i can't write a book then you figure out how you do it you meet a person they type you talk then they have an idea, they type, you wait. Then they read it back to you, and then you argue over every word. <laughs> I have to, so this, I'm jumping out a little bit. This is like listening to, thinking about you, young Henry Winkler, lack lack of confidence, you know, struggling with this, like thinking that you're dumb. I, the Fonz is just like the opposite of this, right? I, the not. whole key to the Fonz to that character is his confidence, right? Like like the character is so self-confident, right? So where did you summon the confidence to play such a confident person given that that, background? And that is a different story. I I have a master's degree. I went to, I was led into the Yale School of Drama. I got a a foundation. Did they not have SATs for that? They did not. (laughs) 
Got it. Okay. But I will tell you what they had. They had an audition, okay. and I had to do two uh, monologues. One was modern. I got through that. And one was Shakespearean. Iambic pentameter and this tongue do not go together. <laughs> and I literally forgot my monologue completely. And I went once and the dog. And then I proceeded to make it up. I just made up Launce walking his dog in Elizabethan England, and I got in. <laughs> it's a good lesson for you. It's okay. I'm sorry. So then back to my question. So then that was it that moment that gave you the confidence to do the tough fonds? Like no. if I could fake my no. way into Yale, then I could fake the fonds. <laughs> you know what? I will tell you. I will tell you. I had an audition at Paramount one week into landing on terra firma Los Angeles. Yeah. I went 11 people in the room. I had hair down to my shoulders. Everybody in the green room waiting to get in was famous. They were all on television and me, a short Jew from New York. <laughs> and I walked in and I did one thing. Where I got the nerve, I don't know. I changed my voice. I just made the choice. I went, all right, let me tell hey, hey, you, don't look at me like that, all right? Avert your eyes right now. And then I did the six lines I had. I threw the script up in the air, and I walked out of the room. And on my birthday, October 30th, 1973, I got the call, would you like to do this part? Wow. You threw the script up in the air? I did. I walked out. I said, hey, all right, I'm done. Oh, and then I just... Sorted out. I sorted. No um, skip. So kids that are that's so good. I want to get more into the acting stuff, but the, back to the to the reading and the and and trying to help kids that are dealing with dyslexia. So I, you talk to a lot of these groups. Like, what do you say to young people who are going through this? Like, they can't just pretend to be the fonts, right? Like, how do they will, summon confidence themselves? I will tell you what I what I say. I say two things. I say first of all. How you learn has nothing to do with how brilliant you are. That's number one. You don't know what you can achieve, what is inside your imagination until you try. Two, every one of you sitting here, no matter what country, no matter whether it's 300 children, 500 children, from kindergarten to 12th grade, I say to them, you are powerful. You have got greatness inside you already. You all know what you're great at. The world needs what you're great at. You dig it out and you give it to the world as a gift because if you don't, the world will be less. You know, sometimes I have these just like transcendent moments where I think about me as a kid watching you and Happy Days reruns in the 80s. And then I think about me now with a second grader who's struggling to read. And you're sitting here saying the things that I wish I could say to him all the time to help him not be so frustrated. And it's like just these incredible things coming together uh, and it's, am it's amazing to watch you. It's amazing that this is this is how you've like what you do in the world. That that's what you put in. Which is this is it. This is what I made a deal with myself and my wife that I would be a different parent than I grew up with, and that my children can talk to me and say anything that is on their mind as long as I don't weep. And we heard child is a powerful child. And I'm telling you, they you will say to your second grader all of these things, and he will say, you have to say that, Mom. You're my mom. <laughs> and you say, actually, I'm looking at you. I am I see you, and I'm going to say this because I mean it, and you will repeat it 18 times a day for the next 18 years. And no matter what the flack you get back, you just say, I'm sorry. No matter what you say, what I'm saying is true. 
I'm the weeping. You. I was just gonna Go say ahead. the weeping rule is uh, all of that was good for me except for the weeping rule because I'm like turning into John Boehner here every year. I get older, <laughs> I'm crying more and more. So I need to come I up with too. some different I'm limits you, on Jim. that. I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> Um, I wanted I just on the substance uh, one other thing before we about this on the on the dyslexia and the substance I, it's funny Sarah's talking about just this sometimes you see things uh, at a time when, when you need to see them and it was just just today I was I was um, I saw a tweet from a reporter that I follow a smart guy and, and he was talking about how he is a dyslexic kid and um, he's in Colorado and it took him years to figure it out and because still to this day they don't do a screen for this yes. uh, for uh, for young kids it in schools. It costs too much money. It costs them money because they are then responsible for a special um, uh, look at education for that child or anybody else. One out of six children have some sort of learning challenge. That's a lot of population. Right. And how can the greatest country in the world not only not feed our children? but also neglect that possibly they are wired differently and learn differently. Yeah, I mean, as so is out, is there been, you know, I've seen as you've done activism on this, is it funding? Is it just as simple as that? Or are there other substantive funding. things you've seen that places have done better or worse? It's funding because there are so many teachers now who are learning about how to um, react to a special um, uh, a, a, spe a kid who learns in a, in a special way. There are schools for that now. Uh, here in L.A., there are many. I've traveled and spoken to schools all over the country who primarily uh, specialize in the kid who learns differently. And I'm telling you, where there is a will, there is a way. But it takes your... Um, uh, advocating for your child to um, to 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 shake these people alive. I want to. Uh, I don't know, sir. Unless you had something else on that, I wanted to talk to you. Also, the other yeah. we have other news. Uh, while we're sitting here, we have. It seems like we have an agreement on the writer strike, and so I, I'd be remiss to not at least just get your take on this whole negotiation and, okay. and the ways that the industry is changing and okay, all that. one. We make in this city, in, in, in Los Angeles, we make entertainment for America and the world. It takes a village. And it all starts and ends with the writer. If it ain't on the page, it is not on the stage. The writer, in, in, on Broadway, you don't change a word unless you go through the playwright. In California, we change writers like you toss a glass of water and fill it with iced tea. I, uh, it, it is insane to me, but be that as it may, because I've worked with extraordinary writers over my career. If we don't take care of ourselves now, the business is changing so fast it will be completely different in four years. That's why there is a three-year deal. Hmm. But ultimately, it is the humanness. I, 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 I produced uh, a show with, uh, with my partner at the time, uh, MacGyver. And one of the reasons that we landed on MacGyver is because I wanted to see that guy. <laughs> you make what you want to see. You write what you want to tell. And because we are all the same, you're going to connect. But if you write what you think you should, you will disintegrate like dust. Hmm. I mean, are you, so when you look at, you know, the younger generation of folks coming up in that, I mean, or do you feel... A lot of angst for for you know people in this in the creative business. I mean, there's just so many different challenges right now. The AI between AI and all the streamers, and uh, you know, is there anything in particular that you know what you... I do with AI? I go right to the movie uh, uh, with Hal the computer, <laughs> and I think AI will teach itself to look you right in the ear. 
and go, you know what? I don't think I'm going to do that. I think I've got a better idea. <laughs> Goodbye, humanity. <laughs> that is my, my long-distance view of AI. As much as they try to put lipstick on it, it is so Sorry. dangerous. It is so tenuous. Do I have angst? I have angst that I believe that ritual, that tradition, is a very important ingredient of the glue that binds a society. And young people have less and less ritual, less and less tradition. You know, just a simple example. You make something. I loved making barrel. Now, here's half a circle. My job is to sell Barry along with other people. But my job now to complete the circle is to sell it. And young people don't understand the full responsibility that acting is not being a star. It is you're in the trenches. You're a professional. And part of that profession doesn't end when you go home when they yell cut. Hmm. I, want, um, I mean, I want to let Sarah get in on Barry. I have to admit, I've never watched Barry, so I'm going to wait here and watch you guys sell me on right, this but one. This Tim, is one I've would missed. you do me a yeah. favor? Yes. You now have my text. Okay, I do. There are four seasons. There are yeah. eight episodes Yeah. each season. I think... I have to send you a report card? I think it will astound you. I think oh. it is original, and I think if you like to watch entertainment, it will make you happy. And then would you let me know if I'm right? I will. Do I have to let you know at the end of each season or just at the end of all four? Or? I'll wait until all four. All four. Okay. you got to watch the whole thing. I will do that. But can, I, I, I don't believe where it starts and where it ends is in the same universe. Okay. Well, no spoilers. Let's just go straight to Barry then. No spoilers, but Sarah, since I now have homework, do you have, do you have Barry questions that we can get into that aren't going to ruin it for me? Yeah. Well, let me just start by saying, okay, so Barry, uh, we have a culture person at the Bulwark named Sonny, and it was like Sonny assigned it. It's like he assigns things that he thinks are really great. So he assigned Barry uh, early on before it was complete. And I started it and I was like, you know what? Me, as a, as I've gotten older and as a parent, I have much less capacity for darkness. And the main character is a contract killer. And so it is very violent and sort of gorily violent in some of the early things. And I stopped. I stopped watching. Uh, I didn't, like, I was just like, okay, I'm going to, this isn't for me. And then I saw an interview with you, Henry, uh, talking about the show and it being funny and also, you were so positive in the interview, and you were kind of doing the thing you were doing here. Uh, and I just got all like, you know what? I'm going back to this. I'm going to try again. I'm going to try again. And uh, and this time, I it was like, I think there were three seasons out at this point, so I was like mowing through it. Uh, it is the best. It's such a creative setup. Uh, and your character is the funniest uh, cause you, you are both, you are a good guy and a bad guy. You are self-involved and narcissistic, uh, but you're also a teacher and you have good moments. It's such a great character. Uh, and it is the most surprising show. Um, like I just, I, I got, I fell in love with, uh, the, the, the couple, uh, you know, with, with Barry and, and, uh, the girl who's Sally. escaping, uh, no, say again, Sally, yeah, yeah, th Sally, uh, like I, their relationship, uh, I loved, but it's commentary on Hollywood, uh, was the best. Like, uh, there's this great, there's this great scene where, uh, she is, you know, really trying to read for a role and she's prepped and she's sitting and he's there. He like walks in to like say something to her and the casting agent is like, you, man, you're tall. Come, you've got the part, you know, come read for this part. And it was, you know, just about how much easier it is for men than these women. But you as the teacher, like the, the most special part of the show to me is the acting class are the scenes in the acting class that where you are the teacher and you have these young 
minds that you are both exploiting as well as enhancing. Uh, so anyway, this is just me dumping out my love for this show and this project because it is so different uh, and it does blend these genres in right. this way that is just the best of it. Like now you can start and tell us everything. Like, how'd you get this role? Why did you do it? What do you love about the show? I left, first of all, thank you. I mean, that was lovely. <laughs> so, first of all, I was leaving a, an estate planning, something you guys don't need to know yet, an estate planning meeting. My wife and I were driving down Ventura Boulevard. I get a phone call. HBO calls. Never worked for HBO. HBO? Bill Hader. Bill Hader. Oh, my goodness. Saturday Night Live. Bill Hader. You're on a short list. I said, is Dustin Hoffman on that list? Because if he is, I'm not going in. Because he's an Academy Award winner, he's going to get it. I said, no, he's not on the list. I said, okay. And I auditioned. Max, my young son, who is now in New York, running a show for Ryan Murphy with his wife, uh, a wonderful actress, Jessica. And their two-year-old, oh, my God, they lived with us for five months, and then they went back because the strike is almost over. Oh, my God, the house is empty. My so the strike son, had a silver lining for you. <laughs> huh? So there were some good parts to the strike for you, I guess. No, we that was the either. only thing. Yeah. Live, my little granddaughter running up and down the hall. Oh, my God. Okay, so. Max is here. He directs me in my audition scenes. I go in. I read. I made Bill Hader laugh. I thought to myself, I just made Bill Hader laugh. I go home. I wait for about a millennium. Get a phone call. Want to come in again? I said, in my mind, no, I don't want to come in again. If I mess up, I don't want to be, I, if you like me the first time, I don't, yes, of course I do. He sent me two scenes, Bill, Bill Hader. My, I then sex them to my son, Max. He directs me over the phone, yelling at me about saying every word. I go in the next day. I, now Alec Berg is there who is very close to the vest. I Alec see Berg. Him, Alec Berg. And I think he is, it, his vest is tattooed on. <laughs> That's how close. I think I made him smile. I went home. I waited a millennium. Mm -hmm. Bill Hader called me, said, I can't get you out of my mind. Would you like to play this part? I said, yes. So great. I'm fascinated by listening to that, having not seen the show, but having heard all the accolades and now having the homework to see it. Like, to me, what I want to know is you had, um, you know, we think a lot as us never Trumpers about, you know, me and Sarah were in midlife, had to make big changes, you know, had to kind of summon something from inside of us in the middle of life. You had, you know, this huge role. You're one of the most famous people in the world. Then you kind of feel like you get typecast, right? And and, oh, and oh. you know you had this period in the wilderness of of sorts, and and here you are, decades later, now having to kind of humble yourself. Let's just be honest, kind of humble yourself to to audition, right? I, you know, at certain no, level, no, people are no, uh, audition. No, 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 I let me just correct you there, please. I, that's part of the job. There are people I know who said, "Hey, you know that they know my work; they can see me on tape." Yeah. And I said, the life of a, um, an executive is about 19 months. Some of these people are new. They don't know. You've got to be there in person. You can show them you're walking and talking at the same time. It is, it is difficult. I was sitting in a room with all those metal chairs, all the actors waiting to go in. They went, you're Henry Winkler. What are you doing here? I said, I'm looking for a job. You? <laughs> I love that, though. That's a mindset. That's a yeah. mindset to say, hey, mindset. Like, instead of being like, I was the Fonz, you know, pick me or don't, right? It's to say, no, 
I need to keep working for this. I can reinvent myself. I can do something that is maybe better than than the Fonz, right? Like, so where, where, you know, talk about that from like a life lesson perspective. That is will. That is knowing what you want without ambivalence. That is believing you are a working person and you are not more than anybody else in that room. And what's it like, what's, so, you know, as you get older, right, and it's the, the roles, you know, you're not going to play the Fonz now. Uh, what was it like to have a role come along? Because the thing is, Tim, when you see the show, what you will understand is that Henry is the funniest part of this show. Like, there's a killer, like a contract killer. <laughs> so the conceit is very funny, but like the actual humor oftentimes comes from an incredibly complicated character right like the the this this character you're playing is both pathos like he's sort of a sad he's sort of a sad you know uh actor who's not working who's teaching because he can't work and is kind of jealous of his students he can be cruel um he, he can be a raging narcissist towards the end at like but you are also you end up and i guess maybe this is the actual question is you end up the star of that show you end up at the center of the plot and everything sort of revolves around you did that start that way or did you because you were so special it's like you come you come to this point in your career and you get a role like that that's so perfect for you i can't answer that Uh, i i all i know is this i started and i was supposed to be the narcissist i was supposed to be the bastard teacher i was supposed to be teachers i've had and as I played him, Bill and Alec literally said to me, we did not have that in mind. And as we watched you, thought, yeah, we can go in that direction too. So I literally was doing what I was doing. And they literally went with me and allowed me to just have that uh, dimension. This is the same thing as the Fonz, right? 50 years earlier, right? That character was not six, the main character. Yeah, I had yeah. six lines. Yeah. You were only, and in the first season, I just I didn't realize this, this is before my time, uh, you know, that um, like you were not in the whole first season, right? There were episodes that didn't even happen. I, was, I was in seven of 13. Yeah. That's crazy. And I think that speaks to, speaks to something. Okay. I want to talk about one other show. I don't know if this is the show you usually get asked about, but for this podcast, it's very important. And that show, are you ready? Can you guess what it's going to be? I don't know. Monty. Ah! Monty. Okay. In 1994, okay. there was only one season of Monty. Yeah, all of them. Not time. even a full season. It was a for, even formative even a time season. for me, age 12. And do you play like a, like a, a, kind of like a right-wing talk show host a character? A Limbaugh with a gay daughter. Yeah, and... It was a, How did I, I miss this show? I, well, because it was only on for one season. Uh, it should have been longer, but I was wonder... It changed. <laughs> yeah, because why? changed. When I first got it, Mark Lawrence, who was part of Gary David Goldberg's stable of writers, yeah. sent me a script, and I laughed out loud. It was brilliant. Rush Limbaugh with a gay daughter. And I said, I can't do it. It's too controversial in 1994. I then read it again. And he called me again. And I said, it is brilliant. I can't do this because uh, I'm, I'm having trouble myself. And I don't want to take the risk. I read it a third time. And I called him and I said, there, I, there is nothing to do but do this show. So we did it for NBC, and Warren Littlefield bought it. I was on the way to New York to do the upfronts, which is where all of the actors of all the new shows, all the actors of all the old shows, go and meet the advertisers in one week. And then I got a call, can I have that ticket back, please? Somebody at GE that owned NBC at the time, must have read it and said, not on our network. Jeff Katzenberg then said, we're going to sell it, and we sold it to Fox. 
we made a change. The change was you no longer have a daughter who comes back from college with her girlfriend, Cynthia Nixon at the time, in the pilot. It was Cynthia Nixon. Oh, you end up with yeah. David Schwimmer. Yes. Now you have a son who went to college to study law and came back and wants to be a chef. <laughs> so chef here, is the stand-in for gay here. Here <laughs> is the lesson. When you're doing something, and it starts to get so bastardized that you you don't recognize it anymore. You have got to stop, take your ego out of it, and go home. Hmm. Not, I'm going to show them. We're going to make this anyway. If it gets bastardized and it's not what was originally the passion that sold you, go home. I do. That's a great lesson from that show. I, what I, I'm just curious about, though, is you did the research, right? And so you did the show for the for the for the rush part. And and I just am wondering, we're living through all this now, kind of like looking back on that. Like, it does it does it kind of feel like there's a straight line between our current problems that we were start talking about at the start, and you know the kind of stuff that that character was espousing in '94, or wow. do you think things that's have changed, or that's a very interesting uh, question. Because, you know, Rush Limbaugh, so many of these people wanted, only wanted to be a star. Rush Limbaugh was a 40s DJ, didn't make it, and found his niche in order so that he could buy himself a gold microphone. <laughs> that was it. I mean, that was the, um, the, 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 the moment of his life. It wasn't what he said, it was what he set it into that was the symbol of who he was, I think. Interesting. Um, we, have, uh, we have a lot of imitators of that now. So just in a yeah. fight yesterday with this Clay Travis fella yeah. who- and one uh, of them on, should on get X. a jacket. Um, <laughs> one of them should buy the, the top to his suit. Yeah. The, um, okay, I need to. Time flies with Henry Winkler. We're already out of time. I got to go into rapid fire. So, Sarah, if you have any more questions, you you get one rapid fire question. So, there so, you go. so think about it. Are you ready for rapid fire, Henry Winkler? I am. You are. I'm going to ask you a question. Are Great. you having fun? I'm having a blast. Well, I mean, you. I could. I, I'm having so much fun. I wish we were in person, and I, I wish we you know, had two whiskeys in me and I wish we had another hour, but, um, but you know, those wishes aside, I'm having a wonderful time. Okay. Me too. Go ahead. Okay. Rapid fire. Rapid fire. Everyone gets the first one. Something you've changed your mind about as a grown up. something that you maybe was a younger person. You don't have to spend so much time worrying. It's a great one. That is a great one, even though I'm worrying a lot right now about Donald all Trump. I that do is a good one about all our personal life. But it will come to you. The revelation will come to you. That's wonderful. Okay. This is a popular one right now on the internet. I don't know if you've seen this. I know you're a little bit on TikTok, so you might have seen this. But people I, are getting I, I, asked. I TikTok at uh, Christmas time with my grandchildren. <laughs> I, I'm trying to stay on Twitter, but it's hard. It's hard. Okay. Well, people are getting asked on the internet. Men, mostly, are getting asked. How often do you think about the Roman Empire? Julius Caesar. Okay. I, I have an answer. Okay. Exactly. Never. <laughs> Same. I don't, I don't get this one. I thought maybe you would because I thought it might be a gay straight thing. And I thought maybe it was straight men think about the Roman Empire. But apparently, no. apparently that's not it. Okay. I think um, about Sparta. But not about the Roman Empire. <laughs> you, you are um, you're a couple only a couple years junior of our of our current president Joe Biden. Yeah. A lot of people are, there's a lot of concern, a lot of agita right now about his age. How confident are you that someone that is three years your senior is capable of leading us through these tumultuous times? You know what is so interesting the the image that pushes people. First of all, the man. Uh, overcame stutter. He still stutters and sometimes, but he does the right thing. But his knees, I understand his knees. <laughs> it is not, it, it literally 
it happens. It 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 it, it sneaks up on you, but like. I don't jump off a curb anymore. Mm -hmm. I need to step down. And it's that makes you seem older. I literally say to myself, oh, come on. You got out of bed to pee. Don't shuffle. <laughs> so I, I take it you're saying that those, those, are, those are real ailments but might not limit your ability to I don't yeah, know, the oversee don't the government. Yeah, really connect to the brain. Yeah, okay. Um, do you have a favorite Barry Zuckercorn bit that comes to mind? Yes. Wait a minute. Those are balls. <laughs> okay. And finally, we didn't get to the water boy. We didn't get to Coach Klein. We talked about it in the green room. My favorite spot, the Roy Orbison tattoo, is, is maybe my favorite bit of yours. And I have to tell you, I, I, when I first saw that as a teen, I I did not I did not know you were the Fonz. It, like I went home, I was telling my parents about this bit, and they're like, "Yeah, that's the guy that was the Fonz." I was like, "Oh, really? Coach Klein is the Fonz." Anyway, that's not a question. Um, a comment. Uh, final question. Give us a rec. You said you you consume a lot of television. Your son's a director. I'll always give us something uplifting okay, that people two, should check out. Two, eighteen eighty three. On it's a spinoff of Yellowstone? Yes, but it is a um, an origin story. Yeah. And it is, from soup to nuts, it is astounding. That's number one. Number two, it is a, a show from South Korea, and it is called I Crash Landed Onto You. I Crash Landed Onto You. Where could I find that? I'm you can interested. find that on Netflix. I will be checking that out. I will now, also be one more on yeah, Ridbox. Uh, it is um, Line of Duty. Oh, Line of Duty. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I we shot through every episode. Have you watched The French Village? Have you seen The French Village? I saw part of it. You should. That was you should check out World War II. Am I right? Yes. Yes. Sarah did a whole podcast dedicated to The French Village. Henry. I, I'm, we're we're over the time I promised. I'm I'm honored that you spent this time with us. You have a new kids book coming out, Detective Duck. You have a new biography coming out, uh, which will be out next hour. People should pre-order that for sure. There's Detective Duck. That's the book. I'll be getting that for Toulouse. She is ecologically aware, and gets all of her friends together, in order to save their pond. It's lovely. I love it. It's a lovely message. Um, we'll uh, we'll be discussing it and uh, and promoting it at the Bulwark, and we're just so grateful Thanks. for you coming, Sarah. Do you have anything else? You looked like you had one more thing you wanted. To I say. do. I have something. I, okay. Sarah, I need you to send me your child's name and your address so I can send him some Hank Zipsers, who's in the second grade. Amazing. Uh, I, well, that's so generous of you. You are clearly just the loveliest. Uh, person and I would like you to know if you're addicted to TV. I'm also I don't normally look like this, but I'm on TV and I'm better than Tim. Like way better. You're gonna <laughs> like me so much more than you like Tim. Uh, and so hey, just... more children. I do. I have Toulouse. She's in kindergarten. All right. Well, then you have to send me the name, address, zip code, and their ages. Very I important. will do that. We, I will send you my children and Sarah's children and everyone we know will be buying Detective Duck when it comes out next month. Right. How about that? And, and I, will, I will send you signed copies. And uh, the one thing that I will tell you about the second grade, Hank Zipser. Okay. Hank is short for Henry. Zipser was a woman who lived on the fourth floor. I thought she was zippy. Um, it is written in a font developed by a dad in Holland where it makes it easier for the eye and the page to make friends. Wow. Yep. Yeah. I love that. Um, you well, promise me you'll send me that stuff? I promise you will send it to you. And yeah. the Bulwark community, you're just you're now a in the Hall of Fame, and I'm sure all of our listeners and readers will be purchasing these books. Thank you so much for taking the time, Henry. And um, I hope to do this again sometime, maybe in person. You know what? Uh, me too. And what a pleasure to meet you both. Thank that you so amazing. much. Thanks. Bye-bye.